Okay, let us start with Roy. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk about Valley of Tears. Yes. First of all, thank you for recommending it. Had I had you not recommended, it's very unlikely that I would have. So just to give everybody a context, Valley of Tears is a show on HBO Max. It is an Israeli show, so it's in Hebrew and in some Arabic, and it is a show about the Yom Kippur War. So uh, it's ten episodes. Ten episodes. Uh, highly recommended if you if you can tolerate violence. It's very violent. Go ahead, Roy. Sorry. Yeah. So um, yes, I can't recall a more intimate or convincing portrayal of soldiers in battle of any movie I've ever seen or any video. I also can't recall one that was more gripping. I mean, some of the scenes were almost unbearably heart-wrenching. Yep. Um, yep. You know, tears flowing and it's just, yeah, heart-wrenching. And, the and there's no happy ending, just to let people know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. Well, yes, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the topic. end of a battle. The war then continues off screen. And, uh, and well, and a lot of the people you follow, bad stuff happens to them. And it ends with you not knowing what their ultimate fate is. Yeah. And some you do know what their ultimate fate is. Yes. No, it, it's, it's not um, a romantic comedy. No. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but another strength I found is the clarity of the battle scenes. In many other films, battles are, are just like a largely undifferentiated tangle mm -hmm. uh, of mm -hmm. soldiers and shooting and, and, and uh, stabbing and bombing. And at the end, you hear what happened, but you're just watching a lot of action and movement. And you can't, I find it hard in most of these other films, to really be involved with it. But here, the dialogue very smartly lets you, the audience, know what the strategy of the operation is, the strategy of the battle is. Yep. And then the action, you can follow it as an audience. And so there's much more of a sense of participation and involvement. I think it's an extraordinary technical accomplishment of writing and direction and editing. So an exceptional piece. Now, here's where I have the question. Um, when you told us about the, uh, the, the show, you said something in passing about leftists, some leftist stuff, yep. you know, like, oh yeah, yeah, sort of obligatory. And, and that's where I have some questions about it because some of it I didn't understand. And I thought just about none of it belonged in this film or in this piece. So we have um, a lot, and I'm not giving, there, these are no spoilers because so, this stuff you know right off the bat. Yep. Malachi, Marco, and um, Alush yep. are all members of some sort of resistance or protest movement, though it's, it's not clear, at least to me, a non-Israeli, what, what that movement was. So that's one part A of the question is what movement? Let me finish the, the part B and then we'll, that'll be all ears. Um, and also the relevance is not clear at all because all three are corporals in the Israeli army. They all fight you know, with determination. So it's not as if they're, they're sort of giving it a half-hearted, oh, we have to do this to, co to cover our ass. And then also the other character who I think, well, Ben Dror, who plays a writer, um, he's a self-avowed socialist and yep. pacifist. Yep. But that's almost irrelevant. His role in this that has any dramatic impact is that he's there trying to find his son yep. who has enlisted, or maybe he was drafted, I don't know. Uh, he moved back to Israel so that he could uh, enlist, right. So that has no relevance. So the two parts, A, what movement are they talking about? And B, why was this put in? Because it seems to me irrelevant. And I know so, I'll shut up. 
Yeah, I mean, they called themselves the Black Panthers because they were trying to mimic the Black Panthers in the United States. So, um, and they were definitely, it was a what you'd call today kind of a social justice movement. It was about both um, fighting against uh, racism in Israel, and I'll get to that in a minute, but also uh, poverty in Israel. I mean, this is a period in which there is a lot of poverty in Israel. Uh, and the poverty in Israel is, is primarily manifest in a certain group of people, and that, that has to do with the, with the racism. Um, the, the, the writer is, is there to give you lines like, this war could have been avoided, uh, Dayan and Golda Meir, um, uh, you know, uh, could have signed a peace accord and didn't. Now, I don't think any of that is true, but part of what the writers are trying to convey is that uh, th this was an avoidable war. This was not a necessary war. They have wanted peace. And because of the Israeli government's kind of hawkish, even though it was a labor party, they were socialists, even though they were socialists in power, they were hawkish attitude towards their countries, they uh, declined that peace, and therefore this war uh, happened. So it's trying to shift the blame to the uh, Israeli political class instead of to the Arabs and to create a certain moral equivalency. That's the purpose of having him there. And then the, I think having the Black Panthers, the, these, these young guys, uh, it's there to say, you know, Israel's not such a great country, wasn't such a great country back then, and yet, you know, they still fought for it. And then what did we do to them? What did we do for them? What have we done for them since then? Have, has their lot really improved in life, even though they shed their blood for the country? So it's trying to make a social commentary. It's not, none of that is necessary qua war movie. The war movie stands on its own. The war, as you said, the, the battle scenes stand on their own. They don't require any of this. But it is a little bit of a, undercutting of Israeli society and, and the Israeli political... Now, the Israeli political class needed to be condemned, but for other reasons, not for not signing a peace treaty because there was no such treaty on the table. Uh, it, it's primarily because, um, because they, they missed all the intelligence signals and, and didn't prepare for war, uh, you know, and they... It turns out, here's an interesting story for you vis-a-vis -vis American foreign policy in Israel. So this is 1973. And from what I recently read from unearthed new documents about the war, Golda Meir, who was the prime minister of Israel, about a day before, knew that the war was going to break out. And she, uh, she faced the choice. She could have launched a preemptive strike like Israel did in 1967, probably saved the lives of 80% of the Israeli casualties that Israel took in this war. Uh, probably, you know, a couple of thousand Israeli kids, 18 year olds would have, their lives would have been saved if, if they'd gone preemptive. However, she had been told by Kissinger Kissinger was Secretary of State under Nixon at the time, that the United States would not support Israel ever if Israel did what it did in the Six Day War and started the war preemptively. So she had to make a decision between, a choice between, do I save the lives of these kids by going preemptive and not letting this war get out of hand? Or do I wait, knowing I'm going to take huge casualties, but not pissing off the Americans and getting American support once the war starts. And she chose the second. She chose to appease the Americans. And, and to a large extent, those casualties that you saw there, Roy, were a consequence of that choice. Now, they also didn't let the troops on the ground know that a war was coming. They also did not round up the reserves and get them in place to be prepared for the attack so that the troops on the ground were completely surprised. The reserves took three days to get to the front lines. 
Uh, Israel took massive casualties, almost lost the war, had nukes in the air because they were worried about losing and the nukes, uh, nukes on airplanes in the air, ready to bomb Damascus and Cairo. Um, all of this in anticipation of losing because it, it, it was so bad. The, the plus side is, from her perspective, from Golda Meir's perspective, is that once it was clear that Israel didn't start the war, America immediately was on, on Israel's side and started sending massive quantities of weapons over, starting, I think, on day three, one of the largest um, airlifts of weaponry in history occurred on that day, uh, starting that day. And, uh, and Israel, of course, rebounded and, and, and basically won the war and, and crushed, for the most part, crushed the enemy. Um, but those are the kind of political calculations I think they should have been criticized for, rather than what the movie does. Now, in terms of what were the Black Panthers fighting against, so Israel has two, I mean, many groups, Jews from a, a lot of different parts of the world. But there's a basically uh, a, a, a differentiation between Ashkenazi Jews, who are mostly Eastern European, some Western European, but mostly European Jews, again, mostly from Eastern Europe and Central Europe, and Sephardic Jews, Sephardic Jews are from North Africa, from the Middle East, Central Asia, uh, and, and parts, of, uh, parts of Southeastern Europe, but primarily uh, Northern Africa. These are primarily the Jews who were kicked out of Spain uh, during the Inquisition. Uh, some of them went to Western Europe, so the, the Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam, London, Fr certainly in France, and, and a lot of other places. The founders of Israel were primarily Ashkenazi Jews, or not, not all of them. And there were certainly Sephardic Jews in Israel at the time when Israel, before Israel, well before Israel was founded. But there was a massive migration, most of it forced by Arab countries uh, in 1949 and into the early 50s from Morocco, from Yemen, from Iraq, from all over the Middle East and North Africa. Forced migration of Sephardic Jews into Israel they were kicked out of the Arab countries. They couldn't bring their wealth. Whatever wealth they had was confiscated by the local governments. They were put on planes and sent to Israel. And when they arrived in Israel, Israel was ill-prepared for them. It was a poor country. Um, they were put in tent cities. And, and they never, or for many decades, they never really recovered. In addition, the European Jews treated the Ashkenazi Jews with, with a lot of disdain. Uh, they were they were viewed as less sophisticated, less uh, civilized. There was real racism in Israel between Ashkenazi Jews and Sephardic Jews. Now, um, I never really felt it, but that's because I'm an Ashkenazi Jew, so I, I never experienced, I, I never felt, I, I wasn't, I never discriminated against Sephardic Jews, but I, I never saw it around me. But my wife, who is, who is a, uh, a Sephardic Jew, definitely felt it. So she was clearly experienced, you know, the equivalent of racism uh, in Israel from Ashkenazi Jews towards her because she is a Sephardic. Sephardic Jews tend to have uh, darker skin. The three heroes, uh, three heroes in that scene in the, in the tank core that you mentioned are all Sephardic Jews and uh, they all uh, come from Arab countries. That's why they all speak Arabic and they constantly throughout the movie, throughout the series, speak Arabic. Uh, they are, uh, f you know, fighting for, uh, against discrimination, they're fighting for equal rights, they're fighting, uh, and they're also very poor, so they're, 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 they're fighting against poverty. So it's a mixture of legitimate struggle and, and a socialist struggle that comes from poverty. Um, and, and that's kind of where they come from. The, the author that you mentioned, the leftist author, is a socialist Ashkenazi Jew who is, you know, very, you know, he's, he's with the cause and everything, but, but he's with the cause of those discriminated, but he's, he's never experienced it. He doesn't know anything about it. Um, that's kind of the, and, and, you know, Israel, Israel still has a little bit of that discrimination. When my wife and I got married, it was a little bit of this, Ashken, you know, like a mixed marriage, like you would view here. <laughs> 
Um, it, it's ridiculous and bizarre, and we never thought in those terms, but certainly people around us did. Uh, so it's um, Israel's an interesting place. <laughs> people talk about Israel. Israel's a, um, uh, a um, uh, you know, a, 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 a uh, one race uh, in Israel. No, I mean, they're all Jews there, but uh, they don't look alike. They don't have the same features. They don't have the same skin color. They are literally people who are black, Ethiopian Jews are, are black. Uh, and, you know, so it's a very multi-ethnic um, or multi quote, racist, racial culture, because, you know, I, I don't believe in race, but from the perspective of the common culture, it's a very multiracial culture. So it's an interesting, it's an, Israel is an interesting place. Anyway, that's yeah, that was, the background. That was very interesting, and thank you. Thank yeah, and this is a war, I think I said, when I introduced the show, this is a war, I was 12 years old when it broke out. I was in synagogue when it broke out and um, because it was Yom Kippur, it was, the, we went to synagogue. In those days, I, you know, we went to synagogue in the high holidays, but also sometimes on, 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 the, on uh, the Sabbath, but we certainly on the high holidays went to synagogue. So I was in synagogue and you could tell something was up because every once in a while, a military, uh, a, a, uh, somebody in a military uniform would come into the synagogue, go up to a, a man uh, who praying there, whisper something in his ear, the guy would immediately fold everything up and leave very quickly. And this kept happening. It was clear that they were calling up the reserve. This is in the morning before the war actually broke out. And then suddenly the sirens go off and we all run into the air raid shelter. And at that point, you know, I, I'm getting choked up. Um, <laughs> Weirdly, at that point, my dad leaves. He says, you know, and he basically says, you know, I better go home, better get my uniform, better get my gun and, and leave. And he does. And um, we stayed in the airway shelter until they stopped. And then we went home. I think, no, I don't, I, I, I think we saw him off, but I'm not sure. Maybe we didn't see him off. Remember, and he was gone. And remember, no cell phones. So he was gone, gone now for, for weeks uh, before, before we saw him again uh, into a war that was um, brutal, into a war that people were, were clearly dying. My father was a doctor. So he was a medical doctor on the front lines. He was at, there's a scene, uh, a big part of a scene in the beginning at the Hermon, which is this outpost on the tallest mountain in Israel. And he, when they recaptured that, it was a very bloody battle. He was there. He was on the Golan Heights where this show occurs most of the war. Um, and it was, you know, and we basically, I was, when we got home, we went back into the air shelter at, at the apartment complex, this apartment with six, uh, five different condominiums. And I was the oldest male in the building because everybody else was off at war. I was 12 and I was the oldest male in the building. I had a young sister who was at the time had just been born. She'd been born a week earlier. So we had a week old baby. Uh, my brother was two years younger than me, myself and my mother, my father off to war. And then the other thing I remember vividly is every, every few days, a car would come into the neighborhood, drive down the street, stop somewhere. And a soldier, female male soldiers would get out carrying flowers and you knew you know now you watched which door were they going to because you know they were coming to tell somebody their father had died their, their spouse had died uh, in the war so you, you watched it from the window of the condo which condominium building were they going into and you know and you were of course always worried they were coming to yours and um, so that's, you know, you grow up fast in Israel. I always say that you grow up fast in Israel because you, you experience things that, you know, a typical American doesn't. Even the Vietnam War was far away. As many soldiers as died there as a percentage of the population, far less than as died in, in, in Israel in the Yom Kippur War. It's a tiny little country. Everybody knows everybody. You certainly know people who lose. So it's a, it's a very intense experience the terrorism the wars it's it's there in your face uh so yeah all right oh uh, somebody asked about just about what type of tank did you crew in the idf i crewed on a centurion 
uh, it was, I was the, I think probably the last or the, among the last people in the Centurion, the M60s were coming in and the Israeli tank, the Merkava was coming in. So I was, a, I was on the relatively primitive old Centurions that they were still putting up in the Golan Heights. I was the gunner. I was a gunner on the tank uh, until I, I, I was in um, tank command school, tank command this school. So they, they had identified me as going to be a tank commander and then a, 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 an officer. And in tank commanding school, already before tank commanding school, but I ignored it. But in tank commanding school, basically my back let out. I had two ruptured discs. I landed up having massive surgery and uh, couldn't go back to the tanks, was shifted to military intelligence where I spent most of my career in the army. So that is my, uh, but, but I, you know, I, I could tell stories all day about this stuff, but you know, when I was in the tank call, this was in the winter of 1980, we were in training in the desert, but heading up to the Golan Heights, uh, heading towards the Golan Heights. And uh, there was a, they, they, uh, they basically stopped, you know, usually you went home for like the Saturday. Every two weeks you'd go home or every three weeks you'd go home. But they stopped sending us home and they stopped sending us home because um, there was intelligence that a war was going to break out uh, in the spring. And we knew that in the spring, we would be the cannon fodder. We would be the front line, the first tanks in a confrontation with the Syrians on the Golan Heights. And the intelligence was that the Syrians had been mass tanks on the their, on their border with Israel uh, through the winter under cloud cover and, uh, and uh, that a war was going to break out. So we had the song that we were singing that, you know, the, the words to it were, I know I'm going to die this summer, that, that basically became our little troop song during that winter and early spring. And, and then it turned out, because later, I was in military intelligence and I was uh, adjacent to the unit where the call had been made that a war was going to break out. And it turned out that they had made a mistake, that they had miss, they had thought that a bunch of clouds were tanks or something like that, a bunch of rocks were tanks, and they completely screwed up. And the intelligence was false intelligence. I gave those guys hell because I didn't get to go home weekend after weekend after weekend because they screwed up the intelligence. Anyway, don't get me started on stories because I, I could go on forever. Thanks, Roy. That took me on a half an hour tangent. Uh, <laughs> that was good. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes that should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see I want to see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there, help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share and uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals. Uh, and uh, and show your support for all for, for for the work for the value hopefully you're receiving from this and uh, and of course don't forget if you're not a subscriber even if you even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up 
you'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please.